gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Mr. Warren Hayes Show. Guess what? I'm Mr. Warren Hayes, and I am welcoming you to this edition of my internet YouTube programming schedule. This is what I tend to refer to as the SmackDown Live Review, (laughs) because that's basically what I do. sit here and I talk for, you know, uh, about an hour or so. Um, uh, of uh, about uh, the uh, goings on on uh, WWE uh, SmackDown. Not a bad, uh, not a bad deal. Not a bad uh, thing. Hope you're all doing well. I'm doing really good, and I, I I'm actually enjoying a nice warm beverage, some coffee. The weather has turned in my part of the world, and uh, from the uh, sm- smoldering heat wave. Onto some very uh, clement and uh, refreshing air pressure meter. No, I don't don't know much about weather, but it has been a lot cooler. So I can now enjoy, I can now enjoy coffee without sweltering it up. Mm. That's good. I like me some coffee. I hope you guys like coffee. I hope you guys like Talking about wrestling, because that's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, If you are watching this on August 22nd, which is the day that this video comes out, do remember that I will be doing my combination NXT 205 Live recap show tonight on FightfulSelect.com. I do that weekly for the good folks over at FightfulSelect.com, which is the uh, subscription service of... Fightful.com. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of Fightful.com. If you haven't, uh, go to Fightful.com and you'll have heard of it. (laughs) It's a combat sports news uh, site, MMA, pro wrestling, boxing. It's all covered there. I contribute quite a bit uh, over on the uh, the FightfulSelect.com portion of the uh, the site, of of the service. Well, it's actually... It's not a portion of the service. It is the service. It's the paid service. You can start in as low as $5 a month. You get tons, tons of members-only podcasts, including my uh, my weekly review of the two best hours of WWE programming uh, of the week. You also get uh, Sean Ross Sapp, managing editor, who does the Weekender podcast, where he wraps up the week in wrestling news, talks about non-WWE programming, such as Lucha Underground, Ring of Honor Impact, New Japan, so on and so forth. So that's really good. Uh, Sean also does Q&A sessions. He and I do uh, a monthly retro review of a past pay-per-view. Uh, just this week, we are going to release for members, of course, SummerSlam 1992. It was a fun, fun show to do. One of my favorites that I've done with Sean so far. And uh, Sean was also telling me that uh, the one that uh, the, the review that we did for TNA Unbreakable will probably be released for free as a free preview of stuff you can get on FightfulSelect.com. So that's exciting, exciting stuff. Because TNA Unbreakable was a, is a damn good show with a legendary match on it. You should come check out what uh, what what we do. And I'll let you know when the, the free preview comes up and then y- y'all can co- go take a look at it and like, wow, I want more of this. And there's not just podcasts, then there's... There, there's all sorts of member exclusives and news previews, all sorts of good stuff over at FightfulSelect.com. You should sign up. And when you sign up, you should say, hey, hey, guys, I'm signing up because uh, uh, Warren Hayes told me to do it. And Sean will be like, wow, this guy, uh, this guy's worth something. And by the way, I'm this is my second SmackDown Live review that I'm recording. Last night, I stood in for Sean, who does a uh, on on Fightful.com. He does a weekly uh, SmackDown Live. Uh, he does both Raw and SmackDown Live reviews. And I stood in for him last night because he was he 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 was uh, traveling and was unable to do the show live. So I took his place, and along with Alex Pulowski, the uh, a regular commentator there over on Fightful, I, I, we reviewed SmackDown Live. So this is actually my second go at the show. 
I'm warmed up. So there's a bunch of stuff that I talked about last night uh, with with Alex, uh, but there's a bunch of stuff that I didn't get a chance to talk about, uh, and that I'm not complaining. That's just the way things are. I'm like, oh, okay, well, at least I've got some new content. I've got some new fresh ideas for you guys today. So that's that's good. But you should go check out that review as well. Fightful.com. It's last night. It's the uh, SmackDown uh, review for uh, August 21st. You should go check that out. Go check it out. Mmm, coffee. Mmm. I am really pumped because this was a really good... A really good edition of SmackDown. Lots of stuff happening. Let's get right into it, shall we? We shall. We start off the show with uh, The Miz. With Maurice. That was nice. I'm, they, it feels complete. The Miz feels complete with Maurice. They really are a pair. They're a duo. I think it's hard to... Uh, to establish them or to separate them for too long. When you see them together, you're like, yeah, this is this is what it is. It works. They recap uh, Maurice slipping him the brass knuckles from uh, SummerSlam, which was a good idea because the way it was done, the way she did it was so... Um, the way she did it was so uh, uh, cagey and slick and underhanded. I think it's good because it helped Put Maurice over a little more. I dug it. I'm glad. So Miz comes to the ring and basically, you know, mocks uh, Daniel Bryan's retirement speech. Uh, basically saying, uh, you know, um, it is with, with a very heavy heart that I announce my retirement from ever facing Daniel Bryan again. <laughs> He did what he, uh, he says that he did what he said he was going to do, and that is beat Daniel Bryan in front of a sold-out Barclays Center. And I really like the, the part where he said, uh, 100 Daniel Bryan punches don't amount to one Miz punch. The Miz punch is the hardest punch in all of WWE. The hardest punch of everyone here in the arena. Oh, God, Miz, he's so good. Such a perfect, perfect skeevy heel. Daniel Bryan then comes out, and he's in no mood. He's in, not in a good mood. He starts calling Miz a coward. Um, He says, uh, Miz, what you do, what you are is a facade, and I'm going to expose you for what you really are. And what you really are is a wannabe Hollywood star cosplaying as a wrestler. You know some people agree with that, but that's not necessarily Warren's opinion. I thought that that was a, that's a nice little, it's a good dig. Maurice then takes the mic and says, you know, Daniel, you should change your name to Daniel Bella. And then Nikki Bella's music hits. What a shock. And she runs down to the ring and she's, she's itching for a fight. <clears throat> she goes right for Maurice. <clears throat> Excuse me. She goes right for Maurice who uh, who slides out of the ring. So Nikki Bella ends up punching Miz in the face. And then uh, Daniel Bryan uh, says as the, as the baby faces stand tall in the ring, Bryan uh, tells Paige that, uh, tells them that Paige has made a match at Hell in a Cell, a mixed tag team match. The Brian Bellas versus Miz and Misses. All right. <laughs> First of all, I'm not sure how I feel. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about um, Mi um, not Miz, but you know, using the idea of using the concept of calling yourself by your wife's last name as an insult. I know it's not uh, something that culturally happens in North America or in most Western countries, as far as I know. Some, you know, somewhere can... Uh, there's always exceptions, of course. I do know uh, of uh, couples who have uh, decided to take the, 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 the wife's maiden name as their married name, and I've, I've seen that before. But... 
it just it feels weird to have it as an insult <clears throat> like if um of course it's a heel thing so let's just do it but it 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 just feels a little it feels backwards to do that if i think i would have had more of a problem with it if miz had delivered the line maybe i'm just grasping at straws too because overall i like the segment don't get me wrong and the prospect of having a a match at uh hell in a cell a mixed tag team match you know the cynical part of me wants to uh the cynical part of me wants to call out marketing here just shameless ugly marketing you know putting Miz and Mrs who are in, who are currently having uh, showing great success with their uh, reality show putting them in a match with two other people who appear on another reality show who is maybe not as successful anymore is this a way to to you know uh just generate attention to this new sh to the new show to the old show using the new show to hype up the the old show i'm trying not to be too cynical about it because <clears throat> um if i'm actually okay with them adding this layer to the feud like just giving us a more ms daniel bryan but without stuffing us with another ms daniel bryan match now it just it sort of lightens the load a bit it changed the dynamic changes the dynamic i'm not sure i dig the idea of a mixed tag team on a, on a regular pay-per-view a mixed match tag team like on a regular pay-per-view where uh, where the male competitor has to tag out if the female competitor tags in and vice versa it kind of kills the momentum a bit of a match it could be very well done though but if you're if you hand me the book and please don't, by the way, WWE. But if WWE were to hand me the book, I would book this to to ignite even more, to 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 add some gasoline to this fire between Daniel Bryan and Miz, because I would have Miz and Maurice beat the tar out of Nikki Bella like kayfabe injure her but like hardcore i'd have miz put, get some licks on her like let's get miz over as a disgusting heel like really really over and he'll beat up another this guy's wife in front of him kind of thing you know tie you tie at the end of the hell in the cell match who cares who wins but you just have a hell of a beat down you tie daniel bryan up in the ropes you know I mean, he can't move yeah, Miz and Maurice just beat the shit out of Nikki Bella. This is not a thing about I dislike Nikki Bella, uh, not Nikki Bella, uh, Brie Bella. Have I been saying Nikki Bella since the start? Because it's Brie. I, I think I've been saying Nikki the whole while. Well, it's Brie, and I know it's Brie. I think I need a little more coffee. But this is what you come for. This is this is why you come to Warren Hayes' channels for these delightful uh, uh, mishaps. You know, someone should start a scoreboard of all the names I mess up. Oh boy. Okay. And no, I'm not starting the video over. Um, I'm already 13 minutes in. The um, no, but that's it. it have Brie take the beating of a life, like something really, really harsh. And like I said, Miz gets some licks and it's not just Maurice. Have her do a stretcher job. Have Daniel be absolutely livid. Like, you know, he wants to kill Miz. Then bring us into Survivor Series. The good old fashioned grudge match, a blood feud. That's what's missing right now from from the from Miz and, uh, and and Brian. That's what's missing. It's this edge. They're relying too much on the past. We need 
new memories. I've talked about this on a past SmackDown review. We need more. We need new memories for this feud. We need new reasons for them to hate each other. This would be a perfect opportunity to do it. So it's not a question that I don't like the Bellas. In fact, I like Brie much more than I like Nikki. If, if we're going to be nitpicky here. Uh, I, you know, Brie comes off as more authentic, I find. A lot of people would argue that she's the uh, she's not as good as Nikki in the ring. I'd say they're pretty much the same. But that's just me. Anyway. That's what I do. It was a, it was a fine segment. It was good. Next we get a bit out of the blue. Jeff Hardy versus Randy Orton. I don't know if that I it seems to me I hadn't seen it announced. Or maybe it was announced and it just completely, uh, you know, I didn't see it. But I was like, oh, oh, I'm I'm fine with this. I love the early spot where Jeff Hardy climbs the top rope, you know, and Orton just stands there and sort of like, like slaps his ass. You know, he just goes, slap. <laughs> he, does, he doesn't, it's not like he pushes him as much as just like, whack. <laughs> A double... Uh, a, d a double cheek slap. And Hardy just tumbles over. <laughs> that made me laugh. Come back from commercial. Uh, and Orton is uh, decimating Hardy. Dumped him on the commentary table. You know, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time with the in-ring stuff. Because, um, uh, because you know, it was very Jeff Hardy-ish. Jeff Hardy hitting all of his usual offense, you know, uh, uh, you know, the double leg drop, the low drop kick, the whisper in the wind, the twist of fate. Then he goes, but um, he goes for the swanton, but uh, Orton crotches him off the uh, off the ropes, takes him off, and then and then goes for the earlobe again. He just goes, mm, I'm coming for your ear again, Jeff Hardy. And everyone starts cringing. They're like, no, eh, not again. Uh, Hardy avoids, uh, no, sorry. So, so that's, it's a word. So he's doing that. And then it, 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 it culminates when Jeff Hardy is done with it. You know, it, Jeff has Randy Orton on his back, like flat on his back. He's got both of his legs and he just lifts his leg and stomps him right in the nuts. Stomped right in the nuts. That forces the DQ. Or Randy Orton wins the match, but does not win the rest. And this is where he got really cool. They brawl to the outside. The audience is chanting "delete" as as, as they start uh, as all this uh, as all this clobbering goes on, which I think is really really f funny and awesome. Um, Hardy is clobbering Orton with chairs, but hard, so hard that. He he messes up one chair and he has to go get another one. Like, these guys decided to go all out with each other. He pelts Orton with a handicap. <laughs> and you know what? I hope, I, and I said this on the SmackDown review that I did for Five of Last Night, but I say it again. I hope that there's footage, that that, can, that, that, that camera was active, was, was live, and that there's footage of that, because I want to see that footage. And then he lays Randy Orton out on a table, climbs on some road cases, and swantons off of them through the table onto Orton. Ooh. What's going on with our with, with, with our friend Jeff Hardy? Wasn't he injured? I mean, all of these years, uh, it's look, it's been so well documented. All the injuries that he's had, the, his, he, that devolved into his addiction to painkillers and other substances. and ooh, Why is he still doing this? He's 40 years old. This is a thing that Jeff Hardy, this is both to his credit and to his demerit. Jeff Hardy, at his age and his status that he has in wrestling canon, wrestling history... He does not have to be doing this anymore. We love Jeff Hardy. We are all shocked that he hasn't, not shocked, but we're all thankful, I should say, that he hasn't died 
throughout his career. He does not have to be doing that. He doesn't have to be pulling swantons onto the apron over at SummerSlam in an overall match that has no repercussions, no consequence to him. But here, I get why he does it. We're building to a blood feud. We're building to a grudge match here. Alex Pulowski last night while we were doing the, 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 the stream noted that he, that one of the last, that Jeff Hardy is on record having said, you know, one thing that I want to do before my career is do a Hell in a Cell match. Before the end of my career. Is I want to do a Hell in a Cell match. And I'm like, wow, okay. Is this what we're going for? And is Jeff pulling out the daredevil antics because he's planning perhaps a dive off a certain structure? Getting us warmed up to the fact that he's, you know, he's still the daredevil. He's still uh, crazy. I really like this. I thought that it created something, uh, an interesting dynamic. And it's also good that... Um, that in a feud like this where there's a lot of brawling, that one guy gets the upper hand on the other, you know, that it's not as one-sided as we had seen it up to this point. Uh, it, it's good that Jeff got some in on Orton, and but boy, did he get some in. If if Randy was able to, to, to establish the foundations of this feud with his... Um, with his newly minted heel turn and his actions, his sadistic actions. Well, Jeff just kicked it up a notch and showed, look, dude, you're not the only one who can get brutal. I'm in on this too. I have no idea what Jeff Hardy's doing with his body though. That's crazy. I, as long as no one dies. And I, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'm, I like... I want all wrestlers to have long, fruitful careers where they don't end up paralyzed or in constant pain. I, want, I don't want them killing themselves for my entertainment. I don't want them ru ruining their quality of life for my entertainment. Jeff Hardy has put the effort in. I, maybe this is his last hurrah. But Jeff, to me, Jeff Hardy's legacy goes far beyond a final feud with Randy Orton. But, you know, it, it, he gets to decide how he goes out. He's the dude. I'm along for the ride. Renee Young is backstage with The Bar. And they're here to issue a challenge. But uh, the Good Brothers arrive. And they do some commentary stuff. Some really funny commentary stuff. I think these guys are really, really entertaining. I thought I thought Luke Gallows was particularly good. And between what his skit last night, uh, between his skit last night and uh, him pretending to be dating Nia Jax for a day, man, he's he's my hero. Just that simple. So we're getting, basically we're getting the club versus the bar next week. And I am here for that. And again, I hope this doesn't, I hope. Well, I'm just putting a bit of thought into this. And I was, what I was about to say is I hope we get an extended program. Because I think these are two teams that can complement each other fantastically. Can you imagine, like, think about it for a second. Carl Anderson, especially if he decides to be Machine Gun Carl, right? Carl Anderson versus uh, in the ring with Cesaro? You kidding me? That'd be fantastic. Um, so yeah, but I don't think we're going to get the extended program. Is my point because because the new day are uh, because the new day are uh, the champs now. We're, we're going to get to that a little later. We'll talk about it a bit later, but now that the Bludgeon Brothers are out of the equation, probably because of real injury issues, um, I think they're. I think this is really going to be the match we're going to get next week. Is just going to be winner gets a title shot or something like that, establishes himself or their themselves as number one contenders. Next, we get Naomi versus Peyton Royce 
Um, as the Iconics are coming out, Corey Graves says, takes the time to say, I've followed the Iconics since they were in NXT and they have never looked better. And he puts extra emphasis on those three last words and, um, you know, leave it to Corey to give us the, uh, the old wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That's to what's going on online. Uh, the Iconics cut, cut a promo run, running down Brooklyn, running down Naomi. Um, <clears throat> and then they cut to commercial. When we come back from commercial, uh, Peyton and Naomi are ducking. Peyton is ducking kicks from Naomi. And it's like, what? Okay, this match started. See, again, in Canada, we don't get the picture in picture thing, you know, where you get the commercial and then you have the action like in the, in the lower hand corner. We don't. We So I come back. The match has started. Hey, right, then that's it, it. Doesn't help. <laughs> I can tell you one thing: it doesn't help get into uh, get into a match. Um, Naomi comes after her, and she knees Peyton with the most obvious knee slap, and I just melted. Like, oh my god! It's bad enough everyone is doing knee slaps for everything. I'm still shocked they don't do knee slaps for headbutts, but. Oh, you saw her hand go like all the way up. Wow. Oh, it was that just took me right out. No, this didn't take me right out. It was later on in the match when uh, when Naomi starts fighting back after Peyton got a bit of offense on her, she starts going back at her with kicks and a drop kick, and she's slapping her thigh on everyone. And all I, you know, then all I can see is her doing that first uh, thigh slap in the ring. This, it took me completely, completely out of the match. I was so annoying. Royce finishes with a nice fisherman's uh, suplex into a bridge for the win. And it was very, very nice. And she gets the win. A necessary win, I think, at this point for, for Peyton and the Iconics. I think that was really good. The question that I have, well, not the question, but the commentary that I'd have here. And look, I know they're not... All matches are meant to be classics, but I I thought their offense was both of them. I thought it was really soft, and I kind of felt Naomi was a bit under motivated. I don't think she gave it her best effort. I think she phoned it in. It was it was really strange. Not sure I cared for it. But again, like I said, you know, they, they didn't have a lot of time. It was what it was. But you know, when you think about how our truth, when he's been getting his, when he's been getting squashed recently, and he's just going in a house of fire and he has given it is all. He's like, look, I'm getting four minutes of airtime. I'm going to put on a show. And I, I could, I can understand why Naomi... It's good that Naomi is back on TV. Don't get me wrong. I am 100% behind that. The thing here is that... The, 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 the thing here is that Naomi has every reason to be unmotivated if she is. Because they haven't done a jack with her since losing the SmackDown, SmackDown Live Women's Championship. They haven't done a thing. That... I get that. But at the same time, uh, <laughs> the, they didn't do they didn't do much with Becky either, and she still gave it a, gave it her all. Speaking of Becky, here we go, guys. I gotta I gotta get my um, I gotta get my palate loosened up. Before talking about Becky Lynch here. Ah. Becky Lynch comes out. She walks down to the ring. She's not smiling. She doesn't have the goggles. She's uh, She doesn't look happy. The crowd noise has been considerably reduced. Her theme song, her theme music is loud. 
gets in the ring. She has a mic. She says, I deserve to be standing here as women's champion. The crowd pops. Charlotte deserved the beating she got. The crowd pops. It, the, SummerSlam wasn't about Roman. It wasn't about Brock, Ronda, Seth. It was about me. It was my time. The crowd pops. And she's delivering this promo so damn well, doing her best to not let the crowd reactions come in and to deliver a heel promo. Someone backstage, when getting this, this segment produced, said, Becky, this is critical. People are going to try and cheer for you. You have to deliver your lines one after the other so that we don't have, so that they don't have the time to react, so that it doesn't come across on camera really well that you're milking the crowd for a reaction. You have to get your lines in one after the other, and she did that so well. She tried her damnness to get to cut the, the heel promo, a heel promo that no one bought. <laughs> we'll get into that in a little second. But she did, she did her best here. And it's really the equivalent, it's really the equivalent of WWE giving their, their ring announcers the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the order to not let the uh, one fall chant from the audience get in, which is why they, you know, they no longer stop when, when calling the beginning of a match. This match is scheduled for one fall. They don't do the pause anymore. It's to try and drown that out. Same concept here. She says, I pictured myself as the top woman with the tie with the title held above my head. Uh, but you people, and then she starts talking to the audience. Uh, you act like you were there with me the whole time, but were you really with me? There was no hashtag give Becky a chance. Uh, she says she got a few tweets. Here's the thing. She says she gets a few tweets saying she, Oh, Becky, you got screwed over when Charlotte was added to the to the tag match. A few? Has Becky Lynch actually been online since Charlotte pinned Carmella to be in the triple threat match? I suspect that she maybe has a shoddy internet connection if she's talking about this. She is one of the most beloved WWE talents on the roster right now, like universally loved from, from, from the, from the pros to the stands, to the smarks, to the marks, everyone loves Becky Lynch. What is she talking about? This was so phony. And then she says, when I, when Charlotte won, you guys stood up and cheered for her. I'm like, what? No, you, no, nope, 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 nope. Yeah, nope. WWE, no, you are not trying. You are not going to try and. Make me believe that no one was cheering for Becky Lynch or that no, actually, that, that everyone was cheering for Charlotte when she won. That did not happen. That was not the SummerSlam that I watched. I think it's appalling that creative will be like, no, 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 we'll just, you know, we'll do the, we'll, we'll, we'll do the, uh, we'll do the heel thing, you know, where she, where she turns against the audience, you know, and uh, tells all the, the, it then tells all these things. Oh, you guys didn't stand up. It doesn't matter if it wasn't true. She's a heel. She's supposed to tell lies. But there's a difference here. There's a difference because everyone, because Becky Lynch, everyone buys into Becky Lynch. Everyone buys into her. The promo that she cut, what is it now? Like a month, two months ago where she was, she was referencing to herself as, uh, you know, that she had put in the effort talking about it. It's time for Becky Balboa to, 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 to go for it. It was one of the most sincere and earnest promos. Becky can do this. She can, she can, can, she has a way. And I said this again last night. Becky connects in a way with the audience that cannot be taught. These are naturals. They're intangibles. 
she the, what the way she's able to connect with the audience i'm repeating myself but i think i'm gonna I'm, i gotta go as plain sp spokenly as possible the way she connects with the audience no one else can do it and it cannot be taught So don't get me started on this. Well, I'm actually started. I'm I'm revved up. I'm going. I'm not not only am I started, I'm already I'm 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 going down. I'm barreling down at 150 kilometers an hour right now. It's so dumb. And it's it's so tone deaf by WWE creative to think that the audience will actually buy into this. She says, somehow I've been an afterthought, all right? It, see, again, trying to go after the audience. This, ladies and gentlemen, parentheses. This here is what we generally refer to as a hard sell. And this is what I, I've used this term before. And if you don't know what a hard sell is, it's, in marketing, in advertising, it's a campaign or an advertisement or a technique that uses direct, forceful, and overt messages or messaging uh, to 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 get you to buy something. Right? It's used to dis to describe aggressive techniques. All right. This is. Examples, uh, a, 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 a car dealership, right? Car sales, you know, that's a good example of a hard sale right there. You know, you walk in and then immediately a salesperson pops over and starts talking to you, you know, determining uh, why you're there and what can I do to get you into a vehicle kind of thing. You know, that's a hard sell. Infomercials, they're all hard sells. You know, act now, do this, you know, limited time offer. Those are hard sells. Those are, it's it's an aggressive way to try and get something over. Becky Lynch here is trying to give us the hardest sell. This is not only a hard sell, it's the hardest sell. Hence the title of the, my review today. So, uh, in this spirit of a hard sell, she says... She keeps going after the audience. Somehow, I have been an afterthought in your mind. You keep, you know, when you talk about the best women's wrestlers of all time, my name never pops up in the conversation. <laughs> this is such bullshit. You're a generation, and she says to the audience, you people, you're a generation of all talk and all opinions and no actions. So I decided to take action. Did I just, I think it, oh, wait, <laughs> I just screwed myself up here. Okay, we're back on, I'm back. I couldn't hear myself. All right, sorry. So she says, okay, she says, uh, you people, you're a generation of all talk and all opinions and no action, but I decided to take action. And people are still cheering for that. They're ba She's basically calling them, you know, a bunch of opinionated lazy losers that never do anything, that never get off their ass to do anything, I did it. <laughs> they, they're still cheering. So, obviously, if Charlotte comes out, and she's mad, everyone's mad, 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 mad. And they go for each other. They start brawling in the ring. Paige comes out, starts calling out the entire women's locker room to come split them up because they have a pull-apart brawl, people, and that was really cool. I thought that was so cool to have a women's pull-apart brawl, and it makes so much sense because Becky and Charlotte are in the midst of a blood feud right now. This is friends gone bad. They're mad at each other. This is passionate. They, wanted, they just want to kill each other. This is what we... We're, we're expecting from this to not literally kill each other, but beat the tar out of each other. So they get the, the and everyone's there. They, she, they, they get the entire women's roster out there. Even Oscar's there to break them apart. That was such a good move. And it was so 
nice to see this for the women. I thought that was awesome. I'm going to finish off my thoughts here. I don't know if you've seen my video a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Well, it, a video compilation of some thoughts when they started, when, when Charlotte and Becky were included in, uh, in the SummerSlam match for the women's title, I started wondering, you know, the question that I, was, that, uh, that I posited there was, who do you turn heel? Whose face and whose heel? Because Becky is a natural baby face, an absolute 100% easy to buy baby face. Charlotte is currently a face, but Charlotte is so much more interesting as a heel. And she has personality when she's a heel. She's good. She j she's a flair, goddammit. <laughs> she's meant to be a heel. So, who do you turn? And I posited, and it's kind of cynical, but I'm going to rehash this again. Charlotte, Charlotte looks like a champion. You know what I mean? She has a presence. She's tall. She's blonde. But she, she's also extremely charismatic, extremely personable. She goes to media events and she carries herself like a pro. She knows how to speak. She knows how to get the company points across. If anything, over the past few months now, Charlotte has become somewhat of a spokesperson for the WWE women's division. Plus, I am convinced that WWE management sees her as having massive crossover appeal. To go on, yes, morning shows, but to do... TV appearances and stuff like that. It's hard to disagree with that. Now, you can argue the same thing with Becky Lynch, but I, I don't want to get into that uh, right now. But yes, yes, you could argue the same thing with Becky, that she knows how to do it and so on and so forth. But but Charlotte, as a no-nonsense representative, one that you can just boop, pluck in and boop, drop somewhere else, she's, she's fantastic. So... Do you as a company want your spokesperson slash, um, do you want your spokesperson slash representative slash crossover appeal star to be a heel? I would argue no. I would also argue <clears throat> something that I've been maintaining for a little, a little bit. WWE does not perceive itself any longer as a wrestling promotion. They see themselves as a media company. Their objective is to create characters and IPs, uh, brands within the brand that people will get behind. They've been doing this for a while with Roman Reigns as we're all wondering, well, why isn't there, why don't they just turn him heel? Why don't they just turn him heel? I honestly believe that they don't care about heel face alignments. I believe they really do care in crowd reactions, people being passionate about their wrestlers and whatever they do, whether they're a, a, a heel or a face, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because despite whatever negative reactions you may be getting, whatever people are saying online or so on and so forth, your, your, your reaction, the reactions that the characters get, that the wrestlers get, is what's most important. I really do believe that this is something that they're trying to instill and that they don't really mind, they don't care about heel face alignments anymore because that's not what it's about. Heels can push merch. That's that's the thing. You know, if you if you want to boil that down to this, heels can push merch. John Cena, for all his years uh, of online fans 
business pros, you know, going, you know, oh, John Cena always wrestles, always does the same thing. He sold merch. Apparently, he's still number one merch seller. Roman Reigns is number two. I really don't think WWE cares about these heel, uh, about heel face alignments. Look, do you remember the show Lost? For I don't know if how many people actually watched it. Do you remember when we first were were as an audience were introduced to Ben Linus, Benjamin Linus, the alleged uh, leader of the uh, of the inhabitants of the island? You remember how skeevy and and uh plotting and conniving he was remember that like he was he was he was the big bad but everyone liked him so much because his the he was portrayed so well he was written so well everything was so spot on with it that even though you're an audience member and you're supposed to you're a member of the audience and this is your villain you're supposed to hate this guy we still loved him i would argue that that's why they wrote him into a more positive light turned him more into an anti-hero and eventually a hero as uh, the seasons went on but that's a i'm not this isn't a lost discussion podcast this is the same idea here i feel like uh, I feel like WWE doesn't care that Becky is a heel. They know that people are going to be behind her regardless. I think they know that they're going to just push it forward. The one thing that's insulting in this situation is just that it's so tone deaf. It's just completely don't tone deaf as far as creative goes. That despite the fact that... Despite the fact that they don't care maybe that... Becky is a heel or a face. We as an audience do. And I think it's going to put an extra strain on creative to try and get this point across. And I think that's what's insulting. I think it's it's, it's insulting that WWE isn't reading the room. I'm just like, hmm. Okay. Uh, people really like her, huh? Hmm. Hmm. Because you know next week they're going to try and and up this uh, up this feud more. I'm going to have Becky try to do something really dastardly next week to try and put her over as a heel. I'm willing to I'm willing to bet $10 right here right now that yeah, she's not uh whatever they have her do it's not going to work. This is a forced heel turn. It uh there's so many levels to this. Ultimately, I don't really mind that Becky's turning heel because I know who I'm supporting. I know who I'm backing. And that's exactly what WWE... That's exactly WWE's thinking. Just pick a side, man. It doesn't matter as long as you buy the t-shirts. Next, we had Andrade Cien Almas versus Zelina Vega. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> I did the exact same mistake as I did last night. Andrade Cien Almas and Z Zelina Vega versus Rusev and Lana. In a tape promo, just before the match, Zelina asks to the camera, why are Rusev and Lana demanding another match again tonight? And for that moment in time, Zelina was all of us. I liked how they led into, uh, you know, the they were how they said in that same promo, forget about Rusev Day, it's all about... Andrade, I like that. That was a nice little. That was nice. Um, it's nothing that we haven't seen between these four at this point. It's, we've seen it quite a bit. Hopefully, this is the final blow off. Um, almost does a hanging arm bar uh, off the top rope on uh, Rusev, which looked which the lock in was kind of slow and it didn't look really painful i don't know if it was it was if it wasn't locked in properly if rusev wasn't selling it i don't know it just it looked crummy lana tags in and jumps off um, jumps off almas who's on all fours to charge zelina out of the ring and it just looks soft it, look didn't care much for this match what 
I don't know. I don't think these four work well together. I think that if you put, I think that if you put Rusev and Andrade together, just the two of them, they can spin more magic like they did a few weeks ago. I don't know why they're insisting on keeping the uh, the ladies in here, um, because it's a bit of a drag. Because Rusev, when he gets the hot tag in, man, that Rusev is a house of fire. He's excellent. So the match ends when, uh, as uh, Zelina is distracting the ref, Almas uh, runs in, has a chair, but out of nowhere, Aiden English appears and grabs the chair off of Almas, preventing him from using it. And Rusev gets an accolade on Almas for the win. So Aiden English actually helped. Rusev Day is fine, folks. At least I hope so. <laughs> we'll see what happens next week. But that's good. I like that. And he appeared out of nowhere. You know, I think I think we have a legitimate reason. I think that right now we know why. Um, I think we know why uh, Aiden English is so pale. He's a ghost. He just <laughs> appeared out of nowhere. I think it's official. Aiden English is a ghost. Shinsuke does an iPhone promo where he, he you know, he reads the, the poem off of the uh, Statue of Liberty saying, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Saying that he uh, defeated Jeff Hardy and he retained his U.S. title. And now he welcomes everyone to the United States of Knock America. Uh, I, I, I'm here for this. Some folks are, you know, obviously the question everyone is asking Oh, well, who's next? Who do you put up against uh, against Shinsuke? Rusev. Let's put Rusev. Let's go with Rusev. Nah, let's give Nakamura a good, a, a bit more of a, a, a of a defense run because I think that Rusev should probably get the U.S. title next. That'd be nice, but not just yet. I'd go for Ty. Give us a short program, at least leading into Hell in a Cell with Ty Dillinger. That, that would work. They fought before uh, in a bit of a squash match, but I think that I think you could raise Ty up and it would probably be a really good match. Then give us uh, Rusev and Nakamura for like um, Survivor Series. We get a uh, backstage promo with uh, Paige, who's with Carmella. Our truth comes in. <laughs> He comes right up to Carmel and he's like, yeah, you've been ducking me, dodging me for weeks. I'm going to pin you and get my title opportunity. <laughs> and Paige is like, our truth is that's not how it works. It's not, you don't have to pin Carmella to get a title shot. That's not, that's not instantly how it works. <laughs> he looks at Carmella. He's like, anyway, he says, uh, you got lucky this time. Then he walks off. This basically sets up Carmella versus uh, Charlotte next week. We get the rematch. So, of course, that's it. Becky's coming in. Finally, we get the Bludgeon Brothers versus the New Day. Um, news came out during the day that uh, Eric Rowan has a torn bicep again. And that sucks. He's going to need surgery. And that sucks. Man, these guys cannot catch a proper break. I like Eric Rowan in his role and what he does as big, creepy uh, backdoorsman that lives in a... Uh, in, a, in a shed, you know, uh, piling the bones of the animals that he hunts in a corner of his house. I, <laughs> yeah, that can and that's what he does. I like, I like Eric Rowan and it sucks and it sucks for Luke Harper, who is such a great talent. Um, It sucks that he's being relegated again, that he, he might be de-pushed and that's the problem with injuries in wrestling is that it shortens the career it, it has a tendency to shorten careers to begin with but it also hurts careers in other ways like Rowan is injured now now they have to do something else they have to take the Bludgeon Brothers out of the equation they've been working really really hard on booking them and promoting them and making them credible threats and now mm, stupid stupid shit like that will just really do damage to one's career because now eventually probably Rowan's going to come back where do you go from here Rowan doesn't have the star power 
to just like, hey, Eric Owens, Eric Owens back and everybody, let's get excited. You have to get him into another program, into another gimmick. We have to relearn about Eric Rowan. This sucks. It really sucks. Big E is not in the match because he sustained uh, rib injuries, which is probably very, very kayfabe because the story here is that the Bludgeon Brothers are crushing the two smaller guys of the New Day. Big E should have been in this, but he's hurt. So what, it, what are the two smaller guys going to do if the big man is hurt? Early on in the match, Wood, they're, they're all brawling on the outside because this is a no DQ match. And it's for the SmackDown women's. Uh, women's. <laughs> SmackDown. That'd be odd. It'd be, it, but it's for the SmackDown uh, tag team titles. So early on, Woods is on the outside. Uh, everyone's fighting on the outside. Wood drop kicks Harper over the announce table, which was really, it was a nice visual. Harper bumps like no one else. He really does. He, he, I love Luke Harper. I, if anything here, uh, give me... Give me, uh, give me another solo run for Luke Harper. I am all about Luke Harper. Uh, so yeah, so over the announce table and a little later, not shortly after that, I should say, Harper throws a commentator's chair right at Kofi. Kofi eats it. Like that's the definition of eating something. That's what Kofi Kingston did. He ate that commentator's chair. It flew. That was such a good visual. Back in commercial from commercial, the Bros are in control, and they're they're in control for most of this match. Let's be let's be honest. Eric Rowan is working on Xavier Woods outside. He's completely grounding him. Um, New New Day pull out a, a ladder. Um, Harper does a dive on both members of the New Day as Eric Rowan is holding them uh, by the hair. Um, the Bros pull out chairs. Um, they're like I said, crushing the New Day. They set up the uh, the ladder in the mat, uh, in the ring. Uh, two chairs, put the ladder, um, uh, make a little platform there. They try to do the uh, crucifix bomb with uh, Xavier Woods, but Kofi leaps off the top rope to try and break it up. But instead, he gets caught, and they do the crucifix bomb on Kofi through the ladder because because uh, Kofi's nuts, I think. Um. They get the uh, they get their uh, their larping mallets. Rowan uh, charges Woods on the outside with the um, with the mallet, but Woods rolls out of the way, and Rowan just careens right through the barricade and starts selling an arm injury. Harper sets Wood up for a power bomb. Oh, they have a table, by the way. The Bludgeon Brothers also set up a table in the ring. Forgot to mention that. And Harper sets Woods up for a power bomb. Uh, but Kofi has one of their mallets, uses it on Harper, hits Trouble in Paradise. Woods goes up onto the top rope while Kofi sets Harper up on the uh, on the table. Kofi does a long elbow drop. Not Kofi, but Woods does a long. <laughs> I'll start over. Wood does a long elbow drop. Right through the table, right through Harper, who's on the table, gets the pin. Ladies and gentlemen, the New Day are your new WWE SmackDown Tag Team Champions. I mean, what are you going to do? If at this point, Harper, uh, not Harper, but if Rowan needs surgery, he's got to go out. That's what you do. I have no problem with the New Day being champions. I'm not saying eh, that again. No, au contraire. I love the New Day. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Never split up the New Day. Never, ever, ever, ever. I'd say, I say, let's go with this. I'm fine with that. That's the win. Um, let's, the tag teams on SmackDown are fantastic. I love them. Let's just see where this goes. I'm happy that they're getting another title run. I think it's deserved. They're the most, they're one of the most consistent tag teams they have. On the show, they sell merchandise. They're over. They've always been over, and regardless what they do, they always do silly, stupid shit. But it works because they're they're all in on it. They invest themselves one hundred percent in the nonsense that they do. All three members do. They have such great charisma, and that comes across, right? It just comes across on camera when you see these three guys together. 
they 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 legit like each other. They're legit having fun. They know that this is, that they are living the best possible outcome for their careers at this point. At this point, I'm not discounting any singles matches that maybe Big E would have, so on and so forth. But there's no reason to break up the new day. There is no conceivable reason to break it up. But then again, we've we're seeing it with Becky Lynch. Uh, WWE creative can be pretty tone deaf. You never know. And stupid reasons. Guys, that's uh, SmackDown Live for August 21st. I thought that was a fun show. Everything felt uh, felt important. Felt like it, it, it provided something. Even Peyton Royce versus Naomi, which served to uh, give uh, Peyton a win which was important at this point, I believe, you know, not to just establish them as complete jobbers. Maybe this will even lead on to something else. Everything felt necessary. This, uh, it felt like you had to watch this episode to see what's going to happen next. Good job. Good, good, good job. I enjoyed it. Guys, be sure to follow me on Twitter if you're not doing it already because everything I do goes through Twitter you can find me at Mr. Warren Hayes. And if you're watching this video anywhere else than on my YouTube channel, why don't you go check out my YouTube channel? I have a whole bunch of other videos. I have uh, other commentary. I have all sorts of stuff there. You can find me at tinyurl.com, Mr. Warren Hayes. Just go, go there, subscribe. That's always nice. It's a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed this edition of my reviews. I sure did. Can't wait to talk more Becky Lynch with you guys. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. I'll see you next time. <laughs>